Hey everyone, here we go again. Welcome back to the next episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. And if you're a new listener or viewer on Game of Crimes, a special welcome to you because you've come to the right place to see and hear some of the best true crime content anywhere. Now, my guest this week is a true American hero, a former combat veteran who was shot several times in different operations, a man who I met while working out at my gym, my friend Javier Mackey. And as a heads up, this week I'm posting this interview in three separate episodes. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. Once again, thank you for listening to and watching The Game of Crimes. As most of you know, I'm now posting our guest interviews on YouTube. If you haven't seen any of the episodes, I strongly encourage you to go to YouTube, type in Game of Crimes podcast in the search bar at the top, and see what you think. And while you're there, go ahead and click on the subscribe button, the like button, and feel feel free to share with all your friends. This won't cost you anything other than a minute or two of your time, but this really helps promote Game of Crimes. I know none of this will be possible without your support, and I do appreciate you giving me your time. If you like what you're hearing on Game of Crimes and would like to hear more, go to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. There you'll find several bonus episodes each month, ranging from serious and current topics to some silly and fun events. And... You can get early audio access to each week's interviews before they drop on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. You can even subscribe for free and hear the first five minutes of each episode to help you decide if you'd like to spend some of your hard-earned cash to hear more. That's patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, my guest this week is Javier Mackey, a 20-year retired veteran of the United States Army Special Forces who served multiple deployments in different combat zones namely Afghanistan, along with deployments to other countries. You might ask, well, why is Murph hosting a retired military man when Game of Crimes primarily focuses on heroes in the law enforcement field and crime arena? Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, the Taliban and their supporters are nothing more than criminals. Many of them are terrorists, preying on the innocent, the weak, and those who do not or will not support their warped ideologies. I talk with our guests so you can hear their stories of bravery, sacrifice, commitment to something greater than themselves, and how they deal with life afterward. And that's why I invite heroes like Javier Mackey and others to be on the show. Javier's stories and adventures are so compelling, I decided to divide his interview into three episodes rather than two. So this week, you'll get part one on Monday, part two on Tuesday, and part three on Wednesday. Javier will tell us about one battle he endured during which one of his closest friends went above and beyond the call of duty to to protect his brothers in arms. And that hero, he made the ultimate sacrifice, which resulted in him being awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Wow. With Javier's concurrence, this week's episodes of Game of Crimes are dedicated to the memory of Staff Sergeant Robert J. Miller. Remember that name, Robert J. Miller. In the Bible, John 15, 3 reads, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. May you rest in peace, brother. You know, as horrible and tragic as those events were, Javier's story is one of recovery, perseverance, of not forgetting the memory of his brother in arms, but moving forward to help others. And you're going to hear about their unsung heroes in his life, And you know what I'm talking about, his family. But to hear Javier's life, you know what comes next. It's time to get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Welcome back to the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the game of crimes. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the next episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. You know what I say every week? We have a special guest, but let me tell you, we got a hero on the show today. Uh, He may not own up to it because I'm finding out things on him as I'm doing research that he didn't tell me when I met him in person. So uh, we're going to have some fun with today's show, but it is a true honor and a pleasure to introduce you to today's guest, Javier Mackey. He is a uh, retired U.S. Army Green Beret combat veteran, served multiple deployments in Afghanistan. Um, Going to tell you about how many times he got shot here (laughs) shortly. But um, 
I swear it's 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 I'm I've mean, I've got goosebumps, we, man, just talking about you already. We haven't even started the interview, but welcome to Game of Crimes, my friend. It's uh, it truly is an honor to have you on it's here. Good to be here. Um, and we'll talk a little bit here in just a moment about uh, how I met Javier and where I met him because it's it's a cool place that we both like to go. Although I didn't see you there this morning, no, I, had, I was there. Yeah, I had to go to the VA. So, <laughs> uh, understood, understood. All right, and and for all our listeners out there, I got to hit you with this quick disclaimer. Game of Crimes, now, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We do take these stories seriously, but we never take ourselves serious, especially when it comes to these stupid criminals out there. And so I sprung this on Javier just before we started recording. Hey, this is what it's all about, Small Town Police Blotter. Would you mind reading the story? And he's agreed to. So, Javier, tell us about this uh, This. Uh, the strange person up All right, Maine. so this is a story of Kevin Gray, a 41-year-old 41 thief in Maine. He ordered a ride share to a local TJ Maxx. Then he, bla yeah. Normal. then he blabbed to the driver about how he was going to rob the place. The driver dropped him off, and of course, <laughs> all the driver called the cops. Well, the police identified the driver as Gray. In addition to being a suspect of the crime committed the previous day, they saw that he had warrants out. And when they saw him exit the TJ Maxx and approached him, there was a small foot chase. I can't imagine how mm -hmm. fast he ran, but they caught him and he was arrested. Uh, so Gray had several sets of pre-conviction bail conditions that uh, barred him from several businesses in the area, as you can guess, mm -hmm. uh, because of the theft charges at the store. So Gray is facing charges in relation to the theft, as well as drug possession warrants and violations of conditions of release. Wow. And he had, he had warrants. They always have other oh, warrants yeah, out yeah. for him. There's something about jail. You know, I'm, I'm going to touch on that, too, later on, that keeps criminals keep going back for whatever reason. They keep reenlisting to for those little short deployments or long deployments in jail. And I don't get it, man. And that's, a, that's exactly right. It's you even see some criminals and we'll talk about it when we get there, but you even see come, some criminals commit crime and then sit there and wait for the cops to come and get them. So they can go back yeah. to jail. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but what a, what a, you know what, that guy might get the dumbass of the year award. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to keep robbing places in the same area. And I want to tell an Uber driver who I don't know right, all about. Right. Right. Like he's going to get a high five out of the door. Good luck, man. Hey, hey if, you're, if you'll give me 20% commission, I'll wait on you. And I'll be your right, getaway right. driver. Now, now the driver's accessory. Yeah. Yeah. So for our next story here, uh, just so you know, Javier and I are both in the Orlando, Florida area. So we always got to throw a Florida story in here, yep. right? Which there seems to be more Florida stories than all the other 49 states combined <laughs> when I go to find these the good stories. Good old Florida, man. But uh, and I've heard of him, but I've never listened to the guy. I don't know. I but, think he's the myth, like the mythical beast, like the unicorn. Well, I tell you what, it doesn't matter where you go. People know about the oh, Florida yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, a convicted felon in three different Florida counties eluded law enforcement for most of November. So this was several months ago. But authorities tracked her down, oh, well. not him, her down, hiding in her own home. The Citrus County Sheriff's Office had been searching for 39-year-old Stavy Usher, who, according to her own or to the Sheriff's Department Facebook post, has a history of fraud, grand theft, and obtaining property by a worthless check. And that's just one we got problems paying <laughs> yeah, the bills, yeah, I yeah. guess. Well, but you think about it, I mean, Connie, she's this, my, that's right. my wife. She's a big shopper. So thank goodness that uh, we do pay yeah, those bills. <laughs> if, if your wife is anything like um, mine, she's, a, she's on Amazon all the time, every day. I think between her, my youngest daughter, and my daughter-in-law, I think we keep Amazon oh, yeah. in business. It's amazing. So back to the story here. The Post also noted that Usher is registered as a convicted felon in Citrus, Manatee, and Pasco counties. So she likes to get around. And that she was wanted currently for a parole violation, quote, for the sale of fentanyl and unlawful use of a two-way communication device. Uh, you know what? When you bring fentanyl into oh, yeah. it, this that kind of takes the yeah. humor out of the story, doesn't it? It's not clear what that alleged parole violation entailed, but what is clear is that hide and seek may not be Usher's forte. While deputies were searching her residence, they found her hiding <laughs> inside of a couch, <laughs> inside of a couch, meaning that she's now back in right. custody. She so, could probably use some, uh, take some, take some tips from Bigfoot. 
What's that TV show on the, about the nerds? Watch it all the time. It's Sheldon is oh, one yeah, of the yeah, main yeah. guys Big in there. Theory. Big yeah. Bang Theory. And the only time I've ever seen anybody hiding in his couch is when uh, he pulled one on his yeah, roommate yeah. <laughs> to scare him. Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, this young lady here, uh, she might qualify for that oh, TV yeah. show. Most definitely. Anyway, so thank you very much for playing wrong there. It's, it's <laughs> I know it's goofy, but we have a lot of oh, fun yeah. with it. And, and our listeners, like I told you before we started recording, I try to do away with it. And the listeners, they lit me up yeah. pretty good. So it's, that's why we well, have it. kind of fun. You know, I, it is. And, it's, and, and it was actually the listeners who came up with the idea of, hey, you've got some great guests on there. Have them read one yeah, of the stories. Yeah. So feels really good. So you it might feels have good a, to be involved. You, man, you're going to have to set your high standards a little bit higher here. Come on over here. All right. So how we met, there is a, a guy that I've gotten to be pretty good friends with in the gym that you already know. He's a captain with the Orlando Police Department, and, and I'm just going to call him Captain Jerry because I didn't get permission to use his last name. And and uh, and Jerry, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's the kind of guy that really seeks to be on any type of shows. He just takes care of business, and uh, he is dedicated to his workouts, and, and we've got to be good buddies there. Well, last week, he brought Javier over to me, and, and it happened to be one of those days when I actually was working out and sweating, so I was showing off a little bit because, you know, old men, they're trying to work out yeah. and a young man is kind yeah. of ugly sometimes. But he introduced me to Javier here and just started praising Javier's background, his efforts, he how he has served his country the citizens, how he served you and me, just a freaking hero. And then told me that uh, he'd been awarded a bronze star with a V on it for valor. And we'll talk about that here shortly, but I couldn't get any more information out of him. I mean, I think, uh, and towards the end here, we're going to talk about what he's doing now. I think he's uh, planning a podcast yeah. here in the not too yeah. distant future. So I tell you right now, game of crimes, will do everything we can to support yeah, you. With that thank effort. you. I appreciate that. And, uh, but then I got to doing my research, and and there's a lot of, a lot of stuff you just kind of left out. And I think what it is 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 uh, Javier here is is humble. I think he's proud to have served his country, and he he certainly earned the respect of every one of us. Wait till that you hear the stuff that he was involved with. Holy cow! It was, and it's actually more than what I could find on you, Javier. Yeah. So we'll get into that. If Captain Jerry says you're okay with him, <laughs> then you're okay with me. I, I trust that man. I respect him. And, and uh, he's a lot of fun to hang out at, with at the gym. Yeah, right? it, it's interesting because I have a hard time talking to people. And I've seen Jerry around the gym several times. And I walk past him, kind of give him the head nod. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about a couple of months ago, I saw him wearing a Marine Corps shirt. I was like, okay, he looked like somebody I knew. But I know mm -hmm. definitely it's not him, but I do know that this, this guy I knew that I served with, who's a, who's a stud, they look like they could be brothers. And so, yeah, I approached yeah. him. Yeah. What was it? Saturday. We were, I think it was, and we got to talk and he was like, yeah, you, know, you got to meet this guy over here. And he took off while I was completing my set. And then he brought me over and introduced me to you and, and and you know, it takes, like I said, it takes, once, once I get to know you, I, I'll start opening up, but it takes so much for me to actually talk to people. So it was, so I actually went out of my comfort zone, um, that I normally yeah. have. I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. that, man. Just so you know, I've got a, a can opener here. We're going to open you up today. Yeah. How about yeah. that? <laughs> now, if you guys can probably tell, uh, Javier's not a small person. He's much bigger than I am, and uh, I think my only defense would be, could I outrun him? Probably. And right now, I'm wearing a brace <laughs> on one ankle, and I don't think I can, so I'm going to be nice no, to I him. Got... I do want to point out that uh, Captain Jerry was not in the gym this morning oh, either. Yeah. So you guys are slacking. I'm going to have to, <laughs> like to have some accountability. Yeah, here, yeah, so. yeah. I get it. Hey, you were get, what were you getting ready to say oh, there? So, yeah, just talking about uh, being fit. You know, you put a lot on your body when you join the military. Uh, there's a lot more stress and and then that while you're serving because you're in a leadership position or you're in a an elite unit uh you tend to not you get you have injuries that are masked by overindulging in other things and it's not mm -hmm. until you go sit behind a desk and be a, a desk weenie that all these injuries start manifesting themselves. And you're like, man, I didn't even know I had that part of my body. And the next thing you know, it's just like, 
and, and so it's been a long road. Like I, I, I put on a bunch of weight, went through all the stages of depression and the five stages of grief. And then, um, yeah, we'll talk about that more later, but I got my, and that's why I'm in a gym constantly. So if I'm not in the gym, it's because there was something more important I had to do that. I understand. Mama said you yeah. couldn't go. Just you can own up to it. That's what it yeah. is with me. I think my wife's glad for me to get out yeah. of the house. So she, why don't you go to the gym? Don't you need to go to the gym? <laughs> I wish you, it. I was, wish. I wish my wife would roll over. So it'd be like it'd be like that Marine Corps cadence to give me so it'd just be like, <laughs> yeah, be like yes, yeah. All right, I can stay at home for that, but yeah. I have to get in there. It's it's just funny how all this yeah, works out. It, it really is the. Uh, the gym for me was always a way to relieve stress uh, for, you know, just different things that you're involved with. And now I think it's a necessity because of my age, because when I miss the gym for maybe a week or so, uh, things start hurting that don't hurt when I go to the gym. Right. But I also finally wised up a little bit and I started using, I don't know if you know Nick there at the gym, one of the trainers, but I train with him maybe one day a week and, and he shows me how to do things so that I don't hurt myself. Right. Very smart. Yeah. So. Which I can't say that about many things I do, but that's one of the smart things. Yeah, I did. yeah, yeah. So it's real important. To have, All right, let's yeah, get it's in. real important to have those oh, uh, cool. trainers at least show you the how to do the exercise correctly. Yeah, so. yeah, and they've they've got some fantastic people in there. It's uh, that's one of the reasons I like going there because it's uh, they they like to have yeah. a laugh. Yeah. It's not <laughs> all serious workout. So yeah, I tell you what, though, Nick Nick whooped my butt last week. He I I thought. Oh, I don't know if you played sports growing up, and we'll find out if you did. But if you're like out at football practice and you work out so hard, you're ready to throw yep. up. I had to sit down for a few minutes and put my head between my knees and <laughs> <laughs> swallow deeply, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just so I wouldn't throw up. Yeah, but uh, it's good. It's good. I haven't been back to him since. <laughs> Nick, if you're listening, there you go. You hurt me. <laughs> All right, let's get into your background here. Uh, Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, your family dynamics, brothers and sisters, uh, high school, that kind so, of thing. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Central Valley of California. We started off in the Bay Area in a small mm -hmm. uh, silver or a, a small steel town called uh, Pittsburgh. And there, U.S. Steel opened up a factory after World War II where my grandfather, who was going to go off to the Pacific to fight, uh, ended up... Uh, not going because we dropped, you know, those two uh, big bomb on Japan. And so that changed mm -hmm. everything for both my grandparents, uh, grandfathers, both on my father's side and my mom's side. Uh, my father's grandparents, my grandfather on my dad's side stayed in um, the Bay Area. And then my mom's dad moved into a small town called Pittsburgh. Um, so my mom grew up there. All our brothers and sisters grew up there. Eventually, she met my dad, my biological father, and he, uh, they had me, had a pretty tumultuous uh, uh, marriage. He was in and out of jail. This was during the uh, crack, crack epidemic, and it really hit that community yeah. really hard, especially my family. My, my mom, she suffered from not only uh, uh, domestic violence, but she also uh, fell victim to the... Uh, to the drug epidemic at the time period and she was placed in a really bad place. So she was there raising myself, my brother and my sister. Um, wow. Uh, something, one thing led to another and it's like the third act for her. She, you know, she, she ended up going to rehab. Uh, we were taken away from her and we lived with our grand with my grandparents for a little bit for about a year. And then, um, I never heard of heard from my dad ever again. Uh, during that time period, she met my uh, my stepdad, who raised me as his son. And um, so coming from, you know, he was a divorcee as well, and he was a uh, he was in the at the time he was in the army reserves, and mm -hmm. he worked a couple other jobs too. But he was also a recovering drug addict, alcoholic. And so he was really instrumental in helping my mom um, work through her recovery. And then eventually the two of them um, got settled in the Central Valley uh, in a town called Stockton, uh, where we grew up, where I grew up as a teenager and went to middle school and high school. I grew up playing sports, um, baseball mainly. When I got into high school, I entered. Uh, a different phase of my life. 
because uh, when mm-hmm. I first moved there, I started running around with these kids that were and on. So where you have drugs, illicit drugs during that boon, you also have gangs. So this was at the height of uh, uh, the Bloods and the Crips in California. And I learned really quick that that wasn't the lifestyle I wanted. And, you know, I learned this in middle school. That's not the lifestyle I wanted to put my life on track toward. What What was it you say you learned? What What, what was there an instance? Yeah, so the concrete experience that I went through was I had completed a baseball game and my coach had gathered us together afterwards because it was the last game of the season. We were undefeated and there was a carnival in our neighborhood. And they were like, hey, we're Hey, we're going to do, I'm going to pay for five rides. We'll go there in our uniforms. If it's all right with your parents, we'll have fun for a few hours. So we get to the mm-hmm. carnival. And while I was there, there the the team, so we were the Dodgers. And then we were wearing blue, uh, our blue shirts and uh, our white mm-hmm. pants. And the team that we had played against, uh, I forget what team it was, but theirs was red. And one of the kids from that team was in the, at the carnival. And there were some teenagers there dressed like gang, like they're, they're affiliated with the gang, all wearing blue. And we were all kind of waiting in line for a drink or hot dog or whatever at the time. And they just walked up to this kid. And, and it was really obvious that this kid wasn't affiliated with any gangs or anything. He wasn't throwing up any signs. Um, he wasn't mm-hmm. even from the area, to be honest with you. And um, he was on the other, from the other side of town. And they just beat this kid, this poor kid up for no reason. And I was like, oh, that's, I got, I got all so much going for me. And then two, I had mm-hmm. uh, what played a big, important part of my, my life was my dad, my stepdad, who that's not the way he raised me. You know, he, he raised me to be respectful and to treat up, you know, tr- mm-hmm. to treat people with dignity and to, that's just, wasn't the way he raised me and, and my mom. Mm-hmm. And I saw this kid get beat up and there was nothing that the rest of us can't do. Cause these kids were a lot bigger than us, um, but they're, they were kids mm-hmm. nonetheless. They ended up getting hauled off to jail and this poor kid went to the hospital and spent some time there. Um, he wasn't able to, how, Go ahead. how old were you at that time? I think I was about 13, 13, 14 years old, okay. getting ready to go into high school. Okay. And um, so the kids I, I was hanging, running with in middle school, I really had no choice, you know, because I didn't have any friends when we moved there. And, uh, but I did have another group of friends that when I wasn't with those guys, I was with these kids and these kids were all my band. Um, the kids, I, I was in the marching band and, um, mm-hmm. we were pretty tight uh, to my, when I say tight, we, we did everything together. And so when I got into high school, uh, that summer, cause I went to year round schooling in California cause we just, we, we didn't have enough schools, uh, and schools were overcrowded. So when I was in middle school, there was like 40 kids per class. But when I got into high school, there was like 11, 11 to 12 kids per class with a year round wow. system. So um, I was bust from the bad part of town into the good part of town. Um, uh, and that's where I developed these new friendships. Uh, unfortunately, that crowd that I was with in middle school followed on and um, they ended up then I, I would say most of them ended up in jail at some point, um, serving long periods of time. And then some, I think the last of the guys that I I've connected with in during that time period on Facebook, he just gotten out. And, um, but yeah, they all came from broken homes. They all came from, um, one parent households, whether it be the mom or the dad, um, the parents really, and if, in either case, the parents really ca- uh, monitor what they did. So, mm-hmm. but when ba- the kids I was in band with, it, a lot of them came from single parent homes, but those parents were really active, involved in their lives. Um, they were involved in the the band portion and any extracurricular sports yeah. we were involved in. Mm-hmm. And then we had a really good band teacher, uh, Mr. Everts. I mean, he was a he just graduated college young guy he really 
put the effort into investing his time with us. And when I got into high school, that was the case. The teachers put a lot of effort into us as students and making sure that we understood the material. And that's, and I'm really grateful for the year round system that we were involved in. Um, Cause they luck. gave us that, that attention that we didn't get in middle school. And on top of that, mm-hmm. they really helped shape how we saw the world at that time period. And, um, of course, mm-hmm. there was a lot going on. We had the Gulf War. We had the invasion of Panama prior to that. We had the San Francisco earthquake happen, the Rodney King riots. Um, and through all that, our teachers were there. They were like, all right, hey, if you guys need to talk about this, if you have any questions, um, ask to well, talk to us. And, and they wow. actually invested some time into – answering the questions that we really didn't understand. You know? That's excellent. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's teachers that are actually involved. That's, that's very encouraging yeah. to hear. Yeah. I love school so much that I was almost there. Like even during, so we had the way it worked for us is you have four months, you went to school, you get two months off four months and then you, that's the end of your freshman year. And then you repeat that for the next four. And that's what we did. Mm-hmm. I mean, but when those two months are off, there's still classes going on and you can take some extra classes if you want to try to get ahead for, uh, what do you call it, um, to graduate early or whatnot. But by the yeah. time I was a junior and a senior in high school, I had uh, completed all my prerequisites and I I had like maybe two classes both years that, I, that were mandatory classes I had to take, but the rest were electives. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I took a lot of music theory and I wanted to be uh, um, because I, Mr. Everts was a, was a big, a huge influence in my life. Um, I wanted to be a, um, or I wanted to write music scores. And so I planned on uh, going to a music conservatory there in Stockton and um, I didn't get into it. I went to a, after I graduated, I went to a community college for two, uh, for about mm-hmm. years and I just bombed out. Um, I just didn't have the ear. I can play music, but I just didn't have the ear for listening to music and being able to write it down. Yeah. It's a really difficult language to learn, but, uh, all the other classes I, I kind of excelled in, uh, I wasn't too, I, I wasn't graduating at the top of the class, but um, but college, I wasn't ready for college. And so, yeah. um, but then I was also, I was kind of a dirtbag kid to my parents. And so, yeah, well. <laughs> and this was at the time period where your mom would just kick you out of that. Like my, my mom, I, I smack, I talked smack to my mom and I, she kicked me out of the house and told me not to come back after I graduated Ooh. high school. And so I was out on my own. My stepdad was gone to drill for the reserve and he, if he had been home and I said that, I would probably not be talking. The things that came out of my mouth, you would probably not be talking to me right now because he was very protective Whoa. of my mom. Yeah, and, um, I was. Wow. So I was allowed to come home and wash my clothes and eat dinner on Sundays with mom and dad, my brother and sister. But outside of that, I had to. I was an eighteen-year-old kid living out on my own, living, sleeping in a sleeping bag in a studio apartment that I was paying four hundred dollars in rent, working at KFC and to, uh, in a uh, pizzeria called Round Table at the same time, and then going to school. So, I, wow. um, so at this time, uh, my one of the things my dad said was, "Hey, you need to, as you go through life." You, it's good to find spirituality and the only spirituality mm-hmm. that we had in our home was the 12 step program that my mom and dad, I would go to AA meetings with my mom and dad. And that was kind of like church for us, but we went like almost every night uh, cause my parents needed, that's what, wow. that's how much they needed reinforcement. reinforcement. And then they were also helping other people. They were sponsoring other people through their recovery as well. And so, mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, wow. so I went to this 12 step program, uh, as a kid, uh, cause I needed it cause I was traumatized by the drug abuse that was in the home growing up. And well, my parents just wanted to make sure that it didn't, 
we can break that cycle with them and it didn't carry over with us. And I feel like it worked, but my, wow. so my dad was like, Hey, you need to find, you need to find religion in your life. And this was young. I was young when he, my stepdad told me this and I started attending church. I had that to fall back on. And, um, I, I got baptized when I was 18 and then I uh, went and served a two year mission for my church in uh, here in Georgia across the uh, state line there, just north of us. And I did that for two years. And while I was on that two-year mission, I was I served at what was formerly called Fort Gordon and then what's formerly called uh, Fort Benning. And I was really impressed mm -hmm. with my dad's military service, and I was impressed with the people that I got to serve uh, to minister to while I was on my mission, because a lot of those guys in those congregations were from the Ranger Battalion that was in Somalia. And um, they were vets from that conflict. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know if I knew then what I know now, I would have been like starstruck at these guys because, you know, these guys were it. These were the guys you know, yeah. that you read, you read about in Black Hawk Down. And mm -hmm. so let me, uh, let me just stop you there for a second. And I want to back up and ask a couple yeah, yeah. questions. Um, so with the band, what instruments All did right, you play? So, in band, so I started off playing, uh, playing music when I was in the sixth grade and I started off with the trumpet. Um, when mm -hmm. that's when we lived in Pittsburgh. And then when I moved to, uh, Stockton, uh, I went to school in Lodi. Um, so I lived in Northern Stockton with the Lodi, uh, in middle school there, I couldn't afford, like you can rent, my parents couldn't afford to rent mm -hmm. a, um, a trumpet, but the school provided tubas. And so my band teacher needed a tuba player and she approached me and was like, Hey, would you, if I teach you how to play the tuba, will you play the tuba? And I'm like, sure. You know? And so this tuba was as big as I, you know, I was like, it's called a yeah. concert tuba. So the, the bell sticks straight up and, and it's yeah. like, and <laughs> so she would pick me up on Tuesdays and Thursdays, drive me to school, give me a one hour lesson on the tuba. And she did that for the first half of the year. And in the second half of the year, she just left me alone because I picked it up pretty fast. And so, wow. um, so I started off. So once we moved from Pittsburgh to Stockton, I started playing the tuba. I get into high school. I continued to play the tuba because I really enjoyed it. And, but I started to dabble in other instruments. Uh, I played the trombone for jazz band. I played, uh, and then mm -hmm. uh, we had what they called uh, for marching band. So you have marching band, then you had percussion ensemble. And so the percussion ensemble was just an extracurricular that you do. Um, and, you know, you march around a football or a basketball court and you play, you know, you beat on the drums. And I, I did that for like two years. And then um, and within the band structure, it's kind of like being in the military. You have section leaders and you have, uh, you have the director. Well, uh, mm -hmm. there's a position called the drum major. And the drum major is like the assistant to the band director. but uh, Unlike the band director, the the drum major performs and gets graded during marching competitions. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't right. playing high school sports, I was doing marching band and everything that involved in it. And I was a drum major for two years uh, doing that. And with that, Mr. Everts would give these uh, every summer over the summer, he would do these little workshops where once or twice throughout summer we would go to school and and he'll give us um you know he was really big in the covey uh franklin r covey uh publications and so we started getting some lead developing he was developing leaders and um yeah he, he's awesome and to this day like i graduated in um in the 90s and today i still keep in touch with him on a daily basis that's Even outstanding text sharing a meme nowadays or, you know, liking something on Facebook. So he's been a big, yeah. huge influence in my life. What the, which, which sports did so you play? I played play baseball, school? baseball, and I played a couple seasons of basketball, two years of basketball. Uh, 
What positions? In so both? I was a power forward, and when I played basketball, so I was either a four, three or four man, and then in baseball, I started off as a catcher when I was young. I caught until I was in high school, and then I sat the bench one game, and our second baseman got hurt, so they put me at second base. And then every year after that, that's what I played. I played. I was a second baseman, and I was pretty, pretty good yeah, at it. Infields. In Infield's the place to be. Yeah. The only reason I, I played catcher is because it, you're involved in every aspect of the game. And that's mm-hmm. what that, that was yeah. my thinking as a kid. They, they started me off in the outfield, and that, it like I thought it sucked because not too many get, times you get to catch a uh, – especially when you're in younger ages, you get to catch a fly ball. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then I always threw my arm out when I yeah. played outfield trying to throw it all the way to home plate and I couldn't yeah. do it. But then you're in pain for a couple of days. But I was days. a generation that played um, baseball in the streets. So like like yeah. we, we would play football and baseball in the streets and when a car came down the road you just moved out of the way and then went back to yeah. playing on it. So I don't see kids out yeah. there these days doing things. Rarely. Rarely yeah. You know, um here where we live in Orlando I'll see kids, the community pool is just not too far down the street here from us. So you'll see kids going down there, but never do you see them out playing with other kids. No. Like there's a couple of nice playgrounds here in the neighborhood and you don't see them out there very yeah, often. So like going back to my middle school times, man, like we would get on our bikes, me and the, that group of bad kids I was hanging out with, and we would ride all over Stockton. Stockton's a big city. <laughs> Like we would mm-hmm. leave our, my, my mom was like, just be home for dinner. And so we're, yeah. and so at nine right. o'clock in the morning, we're gathering the dudes up and then there will be like 20 of us rolling deep on all these really broken down bikes, just rolling. Yeah. The neighborhood. Not really causing trouble or anything. Just, you know, we, we go find a park to play, pick up basketball game or whatever. Mm-hmm. Just, just something to do. To do. Yeah. And, and it'd be in the middle of the summer too. And it'd be hot as hell. And, but yeah, you just get out, and we weren't allowed to hang out in the house, even though we had game systems. Parents would be like, "No, get out, you know, get the yeah." So, but in high school, well, and, but in high school, yeah, things yeah, are different. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm no, sorry. But in high school, uh, I started working, worked for KFC, and I worked for a, a car wash. I was working with felons at a car wash. That was kind of fun. Uh, they taught like. These, these felons, like, they were all on probation. And mm-hmm. I swear we were set up for failure because these cars would come in, like, really nice Jaguars, Porsches, what have you. And there would be wads of cash sitting in the center console. And I'm like, dude, I ain't, no. It's this this has got to be a set. Like, <laughs> you, I remember one time I picked up this, like, wad, and it was just nothing but hundreds. And I'm like... I know these fools are just trying and I just put it back. I'm like, no, I should have even touched it. Yeah. And but yeah. They, these guys would, these, these guys, that were, you know, serving probation, what have you, they would sit there and be like, you know, they were like, Hey, little man, like, what's up? And like, Hey, don't ever steal from these cars. I don't care what it is. Don't yeah. ever steal from these cars. And they, these are all convicted felons working at a car wash too. So, um, yeah, in their own way, they're looking yeah, out yeah, for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, doing a missionary trip, so I'm, I'm guessing that's with the Mormon yeah, Church. Yeah. How did and you're living in California? How did you end up in Georgia? So the, what the church does is uh, when you turn at the time when you were 19, you would you would fill out paperwork and you send it to the church headquarters. And I think they just do this thing where they cover their eyes and throw a dart, <laughs> and wherever <laughs> it lands, that's where you know if there's a mission in that area, that's where they're going to call you to. And so, uh, yeah, I was working as a lifeguard at this point. My mom let me move back home when I told her I was going to go on a mission. So, but I didn't get a bedroom. Uh, so I had all my things packed up in a a, two, a box and a suitcase. And mm-hmm. she gave me a blanket and said, you can sleep on the couch. Your brother gets his own room. Your sister gets her own room. And that's it. And I'm like, so, so for like six months I slept on a couch until I got my uh all my affairs together, submitted my paperwork. About a month after that, I got I got my mission call 
And, uh, yeah, I went to go serve in the Georgia-Macon mission. Um, I did that for two years. Okay. Now, I, I, I've got experience. And I've been stationed in Atlanta twice, <laughs> and I'm very, fam- very familiar with Macon. Yeah. You being a black man, did you have any issues down there? Because back then, that wasn't far from being Klan time. Uh, so this is 94. So it was different. It, it, so let me tell you what. I... It was the best thing that ever happened to me because Hollywood had programmed me to think that Georgia was this horrible racist place. Mm -hmm. I, the one thing that I had a hard time with was my accent coming from California to Georgia was drastically different. So when I would be in a, (laughs) in the black neighborhoods, they would be like, Hey, where are you from? And I, I'm like, yeah, I'm from California. And do do all black people talk like that from California? I'm like, well, I know I do. I, don't, I can't speak for everyone. And I yeah. didn't know what code, you know, that code switching, what that is. But uh, no, I, I just, I stood out like a, what, I, I blended in, but, but I stood out the moment. It didn't matter who I was talking to. Mm-hmm. There was one instance we were in the hood. And we, uh, me and my companion got shot at uh, in Fort Valley. Wow. And that was the first time I ever got shot at. And we, and he ended up being a cop and I ended up going into the military. What, what did you guys do that, that necessitated somebody? So, shooting right, so here, here's a story. So we had these, this, this, this uh, black family that lived, that was a member of our congregation. And we had been trying to get in touch with them. And we decided to go visit them at their house and this was before cell mm-hmm. phones so it wasn't like i could just call them up and let them know but they weren't picking up so we were right. just like hey let's go visit them so we drove over to the house and you know they answered the door and everything we're like oh yeah i'm sorry so our phone is not working like, well, well we have an extra phone at our apartment so me and my companion drive back to our apartment we grab the phone come back we plug it in and it's not working so i'm like you know what? I'm kind of good. I used to take stuff apart. Let me go check the phone lines. So um, one of the rules, like uh, LDS missionaries, wherever your companion go, you go. So you're always right. within eyesight of one another. Eyesight and earshot. Your team. Yeah. And this is this yep. is for your safety and it's also for the safety of, so you don't get accused of anything false. So we walk outside mm-hmm. to where the little box is for the phone. And I look, I'm looking at, it's like out of a scary movie. I'm like, the phone lines have been cut. So I'm sitting there like using my teeth and you know, unsplice the wires and I'm twisting wires. And next thing you know, we hear, you know, we just hear this gun, sh- this gunfire coming. And we feel the bullets going past us. And we kind of just stood there like, that's weird. Why would you guys be shooting at us? And then we walked in the house like it was no, like it was no big deal. And we're like, Hey, we, we should get, get home. Cause we, we do, we do have a curfew. Like I think it was nine at nine or nine 30. We had to be eight, uh, back in the apartment. So we went back mm-hmm. and we sat there and I was like, dude, yeah. and that's in that same area. It was snowing and we were walking. We had been out knocking doors and we're walking back to our apartment. And as this guy pulls up, in this cutlass and he was like, Hey, you need a ride. I'm like, yeah, you know, we we're like two miles away from the house. So we hop in oh. and he has this big pig sticker, this knife, this big buoy knife sitting in between me and him. And I'm in the front seat and he looks at me and he's like, what's up? And I'm like, I'm like, nothing. <laughs> All right, man. Like what's going to happen here. And so uh, we had him take his, uh, about three blocks short of where we lived. And we we're like, Hey, yeah, we just live over here. And he let us out. And he's like, Hey man, y'all be safe. Don't be afraid. Here's my number. If you need anything, I'll type deal. Um, and then, then the only other experience I had that was kind of, kind of interesting in that aspect is we're out knocking on doors in the projects again. And this was in Augusta, Georgia, mm-hmm. and we're down off. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so they have like here, we have medical city, right? They, at the time, they had three hospitals clustered in one area, kind of like how we have it in Medical City. Well, we're in that area, but the surrounding area is nothing but, yeah, I think it's Payne uh, University, which is a HBCU, Historical Black College University Mm -hmm. that's there. 
and then you have the projects and we were knocking on doors in the projects and I'm, I'm noticing there's more cars on the street than normal, but it wasn't unusual. So we're knocking and we get it to this one guy's door and I was like, Hey, this is who we are and blah, blah, blah. And he's, he looks out, he looks left and right. And he goes, man, I don't got time right now. Let me get your card. And so we took his name and number and um, gave him our card. And then we, we walked back to where our bikes were and yeah. Oh boy. Like as soon as we were within a, a safe distance from the house, the police swarmed in, bust down the door and arrested this dude. So that's when I learned that <laughs> the Mormon missionaries were considered the GBI. They thought we all were like part of the uh, Georgia Bureau of investigation. So, so it was really hard to get into, uh, uh, some of those black spaces because of that. Um, mm -hmm. I, it was really hard, but yeah, it, those are like the little experiences that you go through when you're, uh, you, uh, when you're a Mormon missionary and it was really, it was fun. It was a great two years of my life that yeah. I, that I got a chance to, uh, experience. We've, we've had a couple other guys that, uh, did Mormon missions, uh, Aaron Turner, went to Mexico and just recently we had Tyler Schwab on who went to San Domingo, Dominican oh, Republic. Nice. Aaron is a really good friend of mine. He still lives out in Salt Lake city, but he's moving to Orlando here. He's building nice. a house. He's, he's been a very successful businessman. And he, but he told me what, what they were expect, what you guys are expected to do when you're a missionary and you're, especially these guys out of Mexico, they were dependent on the locals for food, and, and he was in Jalisco, which is where a lot of the cartels yeah, are, yeah, are located. Yeah. And here's this big – and Aaron's five – he's six uh, – he might be six five. He sticks out pretty – six five white boy walking around in Jalisco, <laughs> Mexico. Sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. But um, the food – he came back suffering from PTSD over lack of food, believe it or not. He had to go through some counseling to get to overcome that. But uh, it sounds like – they just kind of toss you guys. Oh, no. So back in the day, the, the, a lot of the Mormon youth would save up their money to go on missions mm -hmm. and then their parents mm -hmm. would send them money. So, and you get an allowance. It's a really humble yeah. allowance, Yeah, but you don't have to pay rent. You don't have to pay, um, you don't have to pay for utilities or anything like that. And the members of your congregation were, will more than likely feed you. So, uh, and there are yeah. some places like my brother-in-law, he went to Fiji and he had the same, you know, where you go to an impoverished area, you know, people are not as, you know, they're, they're just as generous, but they just don't have, just a, don't lot. have a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, Georgia was a little like, uh, needless to say, I lost weight, but I did, I didn't go hungry. I never yeah. went hungry. Well, that's good. Like, to hear. like the missionaries before me, like generational, had built up relationships with businesses and restaurants, soup kitchens, mm -hmm. and whatnot. We always had food. Mike always had food. So okay, but yeah. Well, when you finished when you finished your mission trip, did you return to California? And what did you go to college? Did you decide military? What did so you at, that at that point, point, I moved back home, got a job working for Sony was going to school, got an apartment, started dating, uh, the normal, the kind of like almost the more normal script for a Latter-day Saint, oh, except mm -hmm. I just didn't go to BYU. I had plans to go to Utah to go to school, but, um, I just wasn't ready for it. And I don't think Utah was ready for me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and but I had this, I, I had this, this pool to go, like I was, the military was just like, it was flirting with it. It, it was like this hot chick just like giving me the side eye the whole time. And uh, yeah. there was guys that, that were in my uh, young adult congregation that were reservists or, nat or in the National Guard doing their thing. And I almost went down that route. But uh, so I was working at Sony and the uh, Army recruiter walks in. And I, I mean, my, I, I was only home for like a year and a half, maybe two after my mission mm -hmm. and I hated, I hated mm -hmm. every aspect of being home. I wanted to be back in Georgia. Uh, I didn't realize how prejudiced California was to my experience in Georgia. 
the same to put wow. um, and I, I say that with all sincerity like because in georgia if someone didn't like you they was just like hey hey and if they were white they were like hey bo i don't like you it had nothing to do with the color of your skin i just don't like you or mm-hmm. it would be you know, they were always nice to you like you were always treated like you were a human that's that was my experience at home in california and i wanted to, i wanted out I didn't want to be there anymore. Hmm. Uh, I I hated everything about California. I felt like I was just spinning my wheels there. So, uh, so when a recruiter walked in, I looked at him and I was like, "Can I get weekends off?" And he was like, "Because ah. I was working. It was a. I, I worked most weekends. And when you mm-hmm. work retail, you work almost all your weekends." And he was yeah. like, "Yeah, well, there's times where you go out to the field and there's training and stuff." But if you don't have any additional duty, you know, you have most of your weekends off. And I was like, I'll be at your office this afternoon. So he waited for me, sat down. We started the paperwork. Um, once once the uh, the maps, uh, when you go to the maps and you get your physical and you take your test and all that, once you complete that and you sign your contract, uh, I went and put my two-week notice in. And I'll, a month later... I was on an airplane to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. And mm-hmm. I, and that was the beginning of my new life. Did you have an idea what you wanted to do in the military? And and why did you pick Army and not one of the other branches? Well, so the Navy really appealed to me because I like the idea of being on a ship. I like the idea of being mm-hmm. part of a bigger thing, but I didn't like what I didn't know, I, my dad was an army reservist and I knew and that was more right. familiar. Um, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, but that scared the hell out of me. I wanted to be a, uh, a fighter pilot, a Naval aviator. Uh, I didn't feel mm-hmm. like I had enough intelligence for that because there was a lot, there was a lot of unknowns. And when you don't know, you, you're kind of apprehensive of taking certain steps, but right. I did serve my mission at Fort Benning and I was around U S army Rangers. And I was like, Hey, that's what I want to be. And so we started drawing up a Ranger yeah. contract and my, I called my dad up and I was like, Hey dad, I'm, I'm going to join the army. And he was an infantryman and he was like, so what do you want to do? I go, I want to be a airborne Ranger. And he was like, and his his time in the infantry was different. There was a different era for him. He was a Vietnam era mm-hmm. a soldier who, while active duty, and when he got out, he went uh, reservist. And um, it was a really different experience for him. And he was like, you know, if you can do anything, pick a MOS that because you can always be infantry. He was like, pick a job that you learn a skill, learn that skill, do it, and then change to infantry. And I'm like, okay, that that makes sense. He's a reasonable guy. He's never led me astray before. So I signed up to be a uh, uh, satellite systems operator maintainer, which is a 31 Sierra. That's the MOS designator. Today it's called a 25 Sierra. Um, For whatever reason, Mm -hmm. they changed it. Who knows? But um. So, so I went to Fort. <laughs> so I was back on my mission in Georgia at Fort. So I go to Fort Jackson and I go to uh, basic training. Basic training was nothing. What, what it was not a, what I expected it to be. It was actually just. It was really annoying because I was a little bit older. I was twenty, twenty two, twenty three years old at the time, and it just annoyed mm-hmm. the hell out of me. You know, people yelling at you and. I'm like, man, and I'm surrounded by 17 and 18 year olds and maybe one or two other yeah. guys my age. So I go through the boring minutia of uh, basic training and then later uh, my advanced of individual training at Fort Gordon. That was nine months. I completed that uh, because I had airborne in my contract. I ended up going, uh, I was supposed to go to but my, all right, so I got airborne in my contract, which meant I was going to go to an airborne unit. However, my orders were cut to a non airborne unit, and the school that they offered there was air assault. 
So I was, I got to thinking, I was like, how can I get both? And I'm a young private. I'm, a, I'm, and I'm like, what can they do to me? I'm a private. They're going to take away rank. I mean, what rank do I have? So I was like, I, I'm sat in there thinking, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to accept these orders. I'm not going to say anything about my airborne contract until I get to my gaining unit. Once I get there, I'll let them know that I have my airborne in my contract. They'll send me this airborne school from there rather than going from going from AIT to airborne school and then to a, another unit. I can kind of control what I get. So I get to my unit and sure enough, I said, I, I, get, I wait about a month and I go up to my uh, my platoon sergeant, like, oh, hey, sergeant, something weird happened. I At what point do I go to airborne school? And he looked at me. He was like, what do you mean? I go, well, I got airborne in my contract. My orders got cut for Fort Campbell. It's not an airborne unit. And he was like, oh, crap, someone messed up. And so mm -hmm. after talking to all the leadership, they said, well, send him to air assault school. He passed that. We'll send him to airborne school. And that's what they did. And so. I was nice. a private in a air assault unit with both airborne and air assault wings. And I kind of manipulate. That was the one aspect of my career. I truly manipulated <laughs> to get what I wanted. <laughs> well, I, looking back at your high school, you were an overachiever there. Now you're in the, the military so while well, you went on your yep. missionary trip and you overachieved you there and you're doing the same thing in the army. So, so yeah, it, uh, that's unusual that, that you planned it out. Yeah, I, 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 I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's see. I, and I looked at my, my risk assessment matrix and I was like, this is acceptable. I mean, I looked I like real, I lived in a barracks. What more can they do than just take my rank? I mean, and I'm not wrong. And uh, so, uh, yeah, they sent me. And um, from there, uh, because I did that, I met my wife. So where at? What, what city uh, were we're in? In, uh, she, so her, she's army brat, her dad, she had just a couple years prior to me getting there. She, her family had just moved from Germany where she grew up mm -hmm. and, um, her dad was stationed there and, um, the kids all grew up in Germany. And are you in Campbell, Campbell or winning or Campbell? Yeah. And so I was dating her. So I'm going to church and I meet her roommate and I started dating her roommate and um her roommate was kind of a what she was a wackadoo man she was like i took this chick out to like a private <laughs> doesn't make a lot of money as it is and i was like i think wow. i had just pinned uh i was a specialist at the time so so i was making a little bit more money so i was like you know what i'm gonna take this girl to uh the phantom menace and the olive garden and the olive garden to me was like that was a that was like going to a michelin restaurant it, I yeah. mean, all oh, the yeah. private salary, and this girl wasn't a stripper. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, I take her to the, so we go to the, to the Olive Garden first and we're eating and they bring out that big old bowl of salad. And she's like, ah, oh, I don't eat yeah. salad. And I'm, I'm like in my head. All right. So that's strike one. Uh, I don't date pit. I don't date picky eaters. You know, I like. So strike, oh, yeah. strike two and three happened at simultaneously. So we eat. She's complaining about the uh, meal and everything. I'm like, all right, whatever. So we're getting ready to go to the movie. And we walk outside the restaurant. And at this particular Olive Garden, they had like a flower bed with all these flowers. And so she picks mm -hmm. up this flower. And I'm thinking, oh, she's going to she's gonna do something cute and put it in her hair. And she ate the flower. And What? She, okay. she ate the flower, so I'm like, "That's when you look at your watch and go, look the time." I, I go, think yeah, I gotta go so home. I'm not, I'm not. I mean, uh, this is not cool because <laughs> that, I think that we, the Olive Garden cost me thirty bucks. The and this was a lot of money for a private or a specialist mm -hmm. back then because we, I was only bringing home eight hundred dollars a month. So thirty dollars that's yeah. that's two tank of gas. That's two tanks of gas back then. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I take her home and I'm like. And this was right before I went to aerosol school and I went to go see the Phantom Menace by myself. And then I started this school, aerosol school, and I'm getting ready to graduate. And I'm like, oh man, I really would like someone to be here. Cause I, I didn't have any family in the area. I knew nobody except mm -hmm. people I knew from church. So I call her up and she had moved. My wife 
who you know who was living with her as a roommate picked up the phone i was like hey can i speak to so-and-so and she was like oh she's not she's not here right now i'm like oh what happened to her is she gonna, when's she going to be back she's not she goes after that date she was upset and then uh, decided to move to arizona i'm like and so i was like okay so i was like all right so what are you doing <laughs> You didn't know you had that power yeah, over women man, like, like that, she, did you? I, I, <laughs> it was like the light switch came on and she scattered like a cockroach. Uh-huh. So yeah, so uh, my wife, I took her out to, I took her bowling. And that night I was like, this is, she was 18. I was 21, 22, I think, maybe 23. She's getting ready to turn 19. Now. And I was like... Well, at least she's legal. Uh, now we know we know we know your wife is in the yeah. house right now because she brought you yeah. something to drink, and I'd hate to see her punch you right off of that seat you're in. Uh, well, she's upstairs working, so so yeah. She she we started dating. And I was just well, this this I love this girl, and this is awesome. So I asked her to marry me, and then we got married. Her dad. I was kind of concerned. With, my wife is white. I'm black. Uh, I was kind of concerned. Her mom loved me. Like I walked in the house, her mom was like, "Oh, you know, you, you're awesome. You want to take her off my hands? Yeah, sure, whatever." Her <laughs> brothers are all hanging. I, I got, I got like, you know, teenagers and little kids hanging off of me, and I was like, "You know, this is home. You know, this is awesome." And then, uh, but her dad was deployed to Korea. You no, know, I don't want to go through any issues you know he shows up for wedding day he was like a black dude so the army had just implemented army knowledge online it was like so if you had the internet you were given a uh, email address your official army email address so i got her Mm -hmm. got her dad's name from her and I, i wrote him an email sent the picture he knew we were dating I uh, sent a picture. I said, you know, in that email, I said something to the effect, I'd like to marry your daughter. Is that fine? So I didn't want there to be any issues. He wrote back. He right. goes, it, it, it appears that you love my daughter. You seem to be a good, a good man. You have my blessing. And I was like, awesome. Oh, that took some pressure yes. off, didn't it? And then from that point on, it, it just, I have a great relationship with my in-laws. I call them mom and dad even when my mom and dad are present. So I, I have to look mm-hmm. at them in the face and say, mom, so they know who I'm talking to. Um, but yeah. it's, my mom, my mom has never asked me not to do it. So it's just, uh, she, they've been parents to me. They've been great mentors. You know, they've always been there for us. How long have you guys been married now? Uh, January, this January will be 35, uh, 25 years. Excellent. And any, any little rugrats running uh, around? I have a daughter. I have two daughters. Uh, no rugrats. They're 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 straight up retards. Or I can't say that word. They're, they're young adults right now. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> this is yeah, my yeah. podcast. You can no, say they're it. young adults now. Uh, uh, I have one that's married. She lives in Utah. Um, she's married to a, a awesome young man. Uh, and then my mm-hmm. daughter, my youngest, is uh, she just graduated the fire academy. And so she, wow. hopefully we'll find it out soon, whether or not she's going to be a firefighter at a, de- working at a department. So here, here in Orange uh, County, maybe Seminole. I think she's going to be up in Seminole. So, okay. uh, but Excellent. yeah, I'm pretty stoked. Uh, I, 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 like I, it was probably one of the first things I said to you when we met is like, Oh yeah, my daughter's a firefighter or going to be a firefighter. Yeah. So, but yeah. I think I said I'll yeah, pray yeah, for yeah. her. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, so we're we're a good team. She's a good teammate. My wife is. Um, we we've, we've had our tr- ups and downs. Uh, she's been there for me out my military career. She's always had my back. Mm-hmm. She's been part of every major decision except for one, uh, and that was moving down here. I didn't tell her. I knew we were going to move down here and I didn't let them know until I had orders in hand and they didn't like it. So yeah, so I had a house full of women angry at me, but yeah, Uh, yeah, we'll get into that after, uh, after we get into your career. Hey players, this is the end of part one. Part two comes out as always on Tuesday. And as a surprise this week, we'll have a part three that comes out on Wednesday. In the meantime, just a reminder that Game of Crimes is now posting interview videos on YouTube. You can find those at Game of Crimes Podcast, and I, and I ask that you click on the subscribe and like buttons. On social media, check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Game of Crimes Podcast, 
and on X at Game of Crimes. Also on Facebook, type in Game of Crimes fan page and join us for some fun there. Our website is GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including all our episodes, the book list, which contains the books written by our guests, Game of Crimes merchandise, and more. And for more content, join us on Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. I have several monthly episodes that range from silly to serious, so come on over and join the fun. In the meantime, everyone stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two. 